hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another episode in our new series, Our Girls Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and I'm joined by Mike Benelli and our newest addition to the hosting team, Sherry Hudspeth from the Vegas Golden Knights. Our goal with this show is to tackle the topics and discussions surrounding girls' youth hockey to better the game for everyone. So if you're involved in youth hockey in any way, we are going to provide value and insight to create both a better environment and experience for everyone involved. For this show, we introduce topics or questions to discuss, and each episode will have a featured expert panelist from around the game to engage in that discussion. For this episode, our topic is, how long should girls play boys hockey? Our expert panelist is a former professional hockey player who has been a member of Team USA in the Olympics, World Championships, and World Junior Championships, amassing five gold medals and four silver medals. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Megan Bozek to the show today. Megan, thank you for coming on Our Girls Play Hockey. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I wouldn't say I'm I'm necessarily an expert, but love sharing my experiences and, and growing up and where the game has taken me. Megan, I would say you're an expert. I, 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 <laughs> thank uh, the, you. Thank yeah, you. The, the Olympic thing and, and, and pro thing, that makes you an expert in my mind. But no, <laughs> jo- joking aside, uh, the first thing I want to do is clarify what we mean when we say boys hockey because obviously we refer to it that is that in the show title because we know that's how most people are going to search for it but in reality in the usa the official title is co-ed youth hockey and then we also have girls hockey does canada have the same deal is it is it different or is that how it operates up there as well i would say that's how it operates um here in canada but they do things differently with birth years and different age groups. So I've been learning growing up um, in the States, right outside of Chicago, we always went by birth year when I played with the boys growing up and then um, switching to the girls side, it was under 16, under 19, but here they do it with uh, an under 11 for the girls and under 13 and under 15. So it's different. and, And I think it poses a little bit of, of a challenge when uh, you have the cross border entering tournaments, because some teams are going to be older, some teams are going to be younger. And that takes advantage, I would say, as their youth. But it's, it's just so fun to see kind of where hockey has has taken it. And I would say I can say hockey here in Canada, but in the States, depending on who you're talking to, you have to say ice hockey, (laughs) because some people think you're talking about field hockey. And Uh, now there's roller hockey and ball hockey, which is absolutely incredible. But um, I would say it, it's about the same, just a little bit different with the age groups here. Megan, can you tell us a bit about your youth hockey experience where you grew up? Did you play girls hockey? Did you play boys hockey? Can you tell us a bit about your your youth hockey experience and, and where that took place? Of course. So I grew up in a town called Buffalo Grove, which is about 40 minutes northwest of Chicago. And started skating at the age of two and a half. I have two older brothers. They were always at the rink. My parents were done trying to babysit me at the rink. So they threw me on the ice and I ended up loving it. So um, I started at a young age, but the first team I was on, I was actually a goalie. No one volunteered. So I shot my hand right up in the locker room. I said, I volunteer to be the goalie. I don't think I stopped any pucks that year. I was too busy waving at mom and dad in the stands to pay attention. So they knew goalie wasn't for me. Um, but I grew up actually playing with the boys until grade eight was my first year with the girls. And so I actually got a year of checking in with Mm. the boys. So when the season started, I was one of the bigger ones out there. And after Christmas, I was one of the smallest. So it was really good for my, for my development to have that year of check and that physicality. Um, but it made it very tough transitioning to the girl side of the game where I found myself in the penalty box a a lot more than (laughs) I would have, I would have liked, but it it was just a different game. And now if you look at the professional women's league, you would have really no idea except for the blatant open ice hits. Um, (laughs) But it wasn't like that when I, when I switched from the boys, from the boys to the girls side. I just want to confirm. So eighth eighth grade, no, no, it's cool. Eighth, Eighth grade, like 14 years old. I'm just trying to put a, put a number to it. Yeah, I would say probably somewhere around there. Or, yeah, 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 like 13 or 14. So I played three years of AAA boys for Team Illinois. Yeah. And then moved to three years of Team Illinois girls side and then moved to the Chicago Mission for my last two years before I went on to play at the University of Minnesota. Understood. Go ahead, so Sherry, he, my bad. Yeah, Megan, so here I coach the Vegas Junior Golden Knights 10U team, um, girls team. 
But our girls in, in our organization right now at this age are playing in a house league, which is predominantly boys. So they are dual rostered. They're playing on a boys roster and then on our girls 10 U roster. Um, I'm getting asked by parents, some girls within our organization, you know, they're 13 and 14, a little bit older within um, junior nights and they're playing boys. So what I kind of want to dive into in this episode is when are you typically seeing girls like that they should switch completely into girls only hockey and sort of I would like to discuss some of the factors that that go into that transition you know you just mentioned checking um talk about the locker room situation having to change by yourself like that those sort of um factors that that go into like when you typically see people switching into girls hockey yeah I mean right off the bat you said it um, like changing by yourself. At, when I was younger, I was able to be in the locker room and then obviously getting older. Um, I got dressed in bathroom stalls in hall closets. I had to go into the car at some arenas that didn't have extra space. Um, if there's a place that I could change by myself, I've been there. I've done that. And it was just part of it. I didn't think anything of it. I wasn't being singled out. It's just the nature of how it was. And if I wanted to play with the boys, that's what I had to do. And it was completely fine. Um, and, and I just, I made it work. I wanted to be on the ice. I wanted to be out there. Is there a certain age that you have to switch? Absolutely not. I still see some of the girls playing with the boys in high school. Um, I see a lot of girls now trying to go with only girls growing up. I think the social aspect, um, the comfort for parents. But if you're with a good group, it shouldn't matter if it's boys, if it's girls, if the development is there. And Sherry, you do such a good do job in Vegas with, with development with those girls. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite impressive with what you've been able to do in that market. And you see when, I, when I've been helping you out in Vegas, they talk so highly of you. They talk about their girls teams. They talk about uh, the, the boys that they've been playing with. And I think it's a good interaction and a good balance, so to speak, to have, because if you're just on one side of it at a young age and you want to switch to say, go from girls to boys, go from boys to girls, I don't think you'll ever go back. Mm. So having the opportunity to play, start playing with your friends, if you're a girl and then start playing with boys if you have some of the friends out there it does it doesn't matter whatever you're comfortable with but wherever that development is I feel like the word development has gotten so lost mm. now because it seems like hockey has become a full-time 24-hour day 365 days a year kind of job even at a young age um, that development is kind of thrown in the back seat and I don't think it it should be like that so Wherever you can get that development, I don't think there's a certain age. I would say I learned a lot about my game, playing with the boys, the physicality, the speed, the toughness of it, the grittiness of it. Um, but now seeing on the other side how far girls hockey has come and how much more opportunity there is. Um, I think everyone has a spot. Everyone has a place to play. It's, it's just, I think, comfort and where that development will be seen. Yeah, good point on being seen too with the, you know, with girls hockey, the older ones, like if you don't switch into girls hockey and you're not playing in the showcase tournaments and you're not available to play in tournaments where all the college scouts are at, like the Stony Creek tournament where there's 120 girls, you may be playing in a, in a smaller market varsity boys team, but Ohio State's not going to be able to see you there. Like you have to be on that circuit playing those tournaments with those teams, I think, to get seen, like you can email, but you need to be seen at the at the girls hockey tournaments at some point you know 16 you 19 you and you're really starting to look to get committed yeah a absolutely and I I just think the body is just different I knew even a year of check in grade seven um like I don't think I would have felt comfortable going into grade eight doing another year of checking where those boys were still growing I was now becoming one of the smallest when I started off being one of the biggest and I'm not a small player. And I just think the safety aspect of that. And then some people have some egos that say, all right, I'm going after the girl. I'm going after the girl. I, I think my parents should honestly write a book um, of the things that they heard at the rinks all the years, some lady 
came up like verbally attacking my mom being like you need to check her birth certificate she's not this age group she's older and I was like okay I'll take that like looking back I'm like I'll take that as a compliment like I just beat your son out there like it's just (laughs) it's it's crazy people are people are are crazy but I know if I had another year of check I don't think I would have felt comfortable going into the corners um having my head down so to speak at at any point but the showcases are where the girls thrive to be seen for a USA hockey development camp, uh, the under 14, 15, 16, 17s, 18s, um, colleges, and now pro. And that, that was pretty much the mainstream. And now I know that you can send video, you can send emails and all of that, but it's still so popular to be seen where boys have 77 leagues of junior that they can pick from where the girls are just not not quite there so those showcases are very very important and I would say if you're one of the top players people will know who you are Mm -hmm. regardless of if you'll be at that showcase if you're playing boys somewhere else Um, but for a lot that's where that's where their journey really starts if they want to continue on um, after grade school and after high school you know Megan I'll I'll say one thing to we say this to our audience all the time that you're probably not crazy, but the hockey world is crazy. And we always have to remind parents of that. It's, it's not that you're crazy. Most of the time, we don't think the crazy ones listen to this show. Uh, <laughs> something you and Sherry are both bringing up um, that's uh, interesting is the fact that, and we knew this going into the episode, there's no answer to the question of the title of the episode. We can't look at any young lady and say, hey, at 12 years old, that's when you should move over. Um, so in a, in a great discussion like this, great questions are going to demand great answers, Right. So I want to analyze with the entire panel here for a young lady, for the parent of a young lady, what are the questions you should be asking to determine the trajectory that you want to go on? For example, you two are talking a lot about being seen and getting to college and getting to a higher level. That's one trajectory, right? So if if a young lady wants to do that, that's a trajectory. There's also a trajectory that has to do with just camaraderie and wanting to be part of a team. Right. And, and, and there's others. So let's dive into that as a group here. What are the questions? And we'll, we'll, we'll take it as the young athlete, the young lady right now. What are the questions they should be asking when, when considering switching or not switching? I think first off, if they have a spot on the team, not just Mm. taking them to, to take them, if they have a name, if they've played elsewhere, um, a, a spot on the team, For me, a big thing is development. And I get asked now on the other side of um, working in skill development with hockey. Um, The development has to be there. You're not just going to go from zero to hero just like that. Um, And you're not going to learn much if you're just working on power play and penalty kill for half of your season at the age of 10. Um, You still have to learn the fundamentals of it all. Um, But then you also have to learn about where the coach has coached before you you kind of want to know where your child will be spending most of their time um, probably more time than you spend with your family mm-hmm. you see your hockey community more than you sit at a table for us as a family of five it happened for probably over 10 years um, and then that's just the reality of it um, so for me I think a big one has to be development has to be getting to know the coach on a personal level. Um, I was really fortunate to be part of a lot of teams that I'm still very close with my coaches. Um, so I, that, I think that just speaks measures to the personality of them on the ice, but more importantly, off the ice, hockey's not going to last forever. Mm-hmm. So what do you learn from, from those teams, from, from all of that? Um, so you have to make sure parents, kids alike, that, it, that it's a right fit. Yeah, you know, oh, go ahead, Mike. My bad. Well, I was just saying, I mean, Megan, we've been on a couple of panels together, and, you know, I've, I've really been able to watch you up close, you know, talking to young men and girls um, just on, you know, their development and their, their path and the way, you know, um, you know, that transition happens from, from, you know, co ed hockey to all girls hockey or all boys hockey. And one of the things you brought up uh, a couple of times, uh, you know, in those conversations was the impact of the conversations that you had with your family, uh, mom and dad, and the opportunity to really talk through those transitions. So maybe could you just talk a little bit about, you know, you know, what that conversation 
could or should sound like when you're making those decisions. You know, it's easy to say, oh, my daughter's the best. She's the best player on this team right now. She has to make, you know, she's, ne she's never going to get better if she doesn't play against boys. And again, we're, we're talking a whole different regions here, right? I'm in the East Coast, you know, Northeast. There's a, there's a lot of girls teams. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to, you know, transition. If you're in Nebraska, maybe there's one team and you have to travel so far to make that transition that then you got to weigh it. But talk a little bit about how, you know, the influence of your family, you know, your personal discussions with mom and dad, you know, led you to say, okay, I I've got to make this transition now. And it's the best thing for me. Yeah, I, I think um, my dad, if I wanted to stick in the fight, I could stick in the fight. I, I could sense that my mom had a little bit of a different feeling, just keeping me safe. Um, but I have the most supportive family through and through. And if they ever forced me to do anything, I would ask if this was really my parents because they have never pushed me to do anything obviously I like, wanted to help me pursue whatever I wanted to pursue, but it was never forced. Okay. Now you have to switch to girls. Okay. Now you have to play here. Now you have to play here. It's what I wanted to do. And I controlled that, which I think made it an easier transition for me, but it wasn't a, a hard conversation to have going from the boys to the girls side of the game. I just knew it was time. Um, the size difference, uh, the, personality differences I, I thought it was just time but mom my mom and dad supported me through that all and made sure I was getting into tryouts for that next season to, to go into the girls game because I was clueless we were all clueless we didn't know we didn't we didn't know and it wasn't as popular as it is now mm. um, but having those hard conversations to say okay am I going to get better I loved I loved hockey growing up but I also played other sports I wasn't just hockey and that was it. Um, but hockey was definitely my, my one passion, but I was concerned. I was like, will I, will I get better? Will I be able to play next year and make a girls team? Will I be able to play? And my dream wasn't to play on the U S team. I wanted to go to college. Mm. I wanted to play college hockey. That's what I was striving for. Um, and then obviously those dreams, those goals changed as, as the years went on. But um, I, it took a lot of effort as well for my parents to do their research on their end to put me in the best environment. So I ended up playing up instead of playing a U14 for my first year, I ended up playing with the U16s, which I think really helped for my development and had one of one of the best coaches, Tony Catchy there that I had for five years as as a coach and um still like one of our good family friends to this day but you have to have those tough conversations and you have to expect maybe a tough answer back but mm -hmm. know that they are responding with your best interest in mind who drives you to the rink mm -hmm. they do who pays all the all of your equipment they do who pays all of your fees they do so you have to realize that they're trying to help you as well and um i like you said before i think hockey's it's grown so much that it it's really has become a full-time job but um you don't want to be that crazy parent that coaches note right. and now on the development side of it i i've seen it all unfortunately unfortunately um but let your kids be kids let your kids learn a new skill off the ice that can help them on the ice they don't need to skate all summer they can blow they can go throw a soccer ball they can go ride their scooters, play baseball, whatever they want to do, but it doesn't need to be hockey, 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 because they are going to make the NHL. They are going to make the PWHL. They are going to be the next Olympic gold medalist. If it happens, it will happen. But there's so much that you can learn off the ice that you can take on the ice. And fortunately enough for me, my parents let me play every sport. I did one week of hockey in the summer growing up. Um, and I'd like to think I turned out just fine. So don't uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, we and we just learned from Brian Trachi. You can you can uh, shovel stalls at the farm or carry <laughs> buckets of milk or whatever you have to do. Right? He I mean, gave us a whole you know, farm you know, workout. Always yeah. have to be yeah, do the farm workout. Yeah. You no, know, but uh, you know, so so you're you know you you hit on one of the questions I had too was about um, you know how important coaches are 
uh, in this transition. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what are some recommendations or some or some pitfalls or some things you should look out for as a as a, a parent of a, a young girl that's looking to make the transition? And what should coaches be looking for when they're coaching co-ed teams? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so much. I mean, I found like I got to coach with the Connecticut Whale for a little while, coaching all women on one team, which is a lot different than the college hockey team that I coached that had no women and obviously all men. So, it, it, but you know, I, I, it, that, that co-ed piece from the, the time you start hockey at, at five years old until, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, maybe a little bit about, you know, what, what could coaches be aware of when they're, when they're coaching teams that have young women, you mentioned uh, the locker room piece and, all that kind of stuff. So what else can, what else can, you know, we have a lot of coaches listen to the show. What else can coaches really look for in making that transition? I would say younger, um, still being the only girl when I was learning to skate six, seven, eight years old. Um, we're all just the same out there. There wasn't any, okay, there's a girl, we have to do this differently. There's boys here. We have to do this differently. Um, I touched on the locker room piece already. It was just part of it for me. I didn't, Dad and I toy said it is it is what it is. That's how if I wanted to play, that's what I had to do. If I had to get dressed at home in the car, um <laughs> in a locker room, in a bathroom, wherever it, we made it work. And once I got older though, with with the boys, um, I felt like there was a little bit of disconnect with with coaching staff because they didn't want to treat me differently, but the reality of it is as, as these girls get older, their emotions, hormones, everything um, about a certain age is, it's hard. It's hard. It's new territory for, for a lot of people, but um, it doesn't need, mean to be that the girls need handholding. And that was a big part of me just acting like one of the boys. And I was just a teammate to them. And I think the coaches had slowly but quickly figured that out that they didn't need to treat me any differently hmm. um I was just a teammate I, I was just one of them and then you go to the girl side and I wasn't ready for the as I pictured in my mind like okay now we're gonna do this okay now we're gonna do this mm -hmm. like that's not how I grew up playing I have two older brothers at home too that make sure I'm not like that and um I didn't get that at all. I, I, there was none of that. I walk into the first tryout from day one of team Illinois. There's a girl already throwing up in the, in a trash can. I'm like, all right, here we go. Like we're, we're into it. Um, but there wasn't any of that. It was still competitive. You have to have constructive criticism in order to get better. You have to learn from your mistakes in order to advance in anything, anything you're doing. And I think the coaches that I had, um, made sure that, that we were just players out there. You so obviously, Megan, yeah. I, so I do want to pull a thread on this a little bit. Uh, could, could we just talk about maybe some specific examples of what you mean when you're talking about coaches, maybe on the boys side saying, Oh, you know, that you don't have to treat me differently. Is there an example or a situation you could explain? Cause I want to give the audience some context on exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. So if you could, again, just trying to pull the thread on that to educate here. Yeah, I, I think the physicality piece on the ice, um, making one, yeah. sure that I'm not, even with non-checking, I think the boys think that they're going to check at the age of seven. So that's what they're teaching um, until it's, it's actually legal out there. But um, okay, Megan, you don't have to go into the corner and do that one. Mm. Um, just items like that, which, okay, but I was like, I'm fine. Like, I don't, yeah. but it, like, again, I had coaches that it, it was great. And I know other people that played on the boys side that wouldn't even be invited to like a full checking practice because right. they were, they wanted to make sure she wasn't going to get hurt where I specifically remember our coach would bring football pads out there, like the big blockers and stand in a corner. So there were three of them and we'd literally have to go get hit by the blocker, go get hit by the blocker. But it was just part of it. That, that's what I signed up to do. I didn't want any other treatment. Um, but then taking that to the girls' side, first practice, I'm just running people. I'm like, okay, this has got to – I have to change my game. I right. have to learn how to play physical without being that physical. Um, but 
the coaches weren't hand holding us. They weren't babying us. They understood, I think. Um, a lot of girls in one room can be a lot. A lot of boys in one room can be a lot for different reasons. Um, but there wasn't any major, I'd say major concerns on that. And even through youth and then with the national team, Bob Corkum had never coached girls in his life as a head coach um, of the U.S. national team coming from the NHL. One of my favorite coaches. One of my favorite coaches. It's a clean slate. Doesn't know a lot about the players, but ran it as an NHL organization. Ken Klee, same thing. NHL organization mentality, um, which it, it's just incredible to see that you don't have to be treated differently. You don't have to be singled out if you're a girl playing on the boys team growing up um, and, and vice versa. I think it's an important distinction to make because, again, I, I think for most coaches of co-ed teams, th they're just trying to do the right thing, right? They're just trying to do what they think is the right thing. But if we don't have these conversations and discussions, how do you even know what that is, right? Um, you know, my daughter is uh, seven years old going on eight. My son is 10. They both play. And it's been an interesting journey for me because uh, my daughter is a very go at you type of person, which I love. Uh, but I've noticed on, on one of our teams, our school team, there's there's a, a female coach and there's several girls players. And, you know, she approaches that situation, not with more glee, but with more understanding of, oh, there's girls on this team. Right. And then for her club team, she's the only girl on that team. It, it has not turned into a discussion yet. And I'm not trying to spark a discussion there because I don't think we need to have it. But as a as a as a dad it's a curious thing to watch, right? That I do recognize that she recognizes there's other girls on the team and that's an empowering thing for her. Now, again, at seven, eight years old, we're still in the, in the might squirt era of hockey where co hockey is hockey, right? It was funny, really quick story. Uh, I won't say any team names, but a very prominent girls team in the area, uh, the, the leader of that organization came up to her and said, hey, when do you want to play for this girls team? And she just kind of looked at him uh, and said, I'm a hawk just like the team that we played for like it wasn't registering on on in her mind this is and this this goes to the age group right it wasn't registering in her mind well oh that's an all girls team and it was just another team to her right um but i do look ahead as a father and and it's not why we're doing the episode but this is why these episodes are so important to me personally is to find those questions and to kind of i don't want to say look for the signs but maybe recognize behavior that is she comfortable or uncomfortable? How is she approaching this? What should I say or not say, right? As a father, not, not just a coach, as a father, I can be put in danger of saying, are you okay? Do you want something different? Like I can't try to treat her differently in that sense either than I would my son uh, or anybody else, right? Um, now, personally, I think she just loves going out there and chasing her brother or trying to score on her brother, depending on the team he's on. He's a goalie or a defenseman. Um, but it's an interesting thought process that, that we go through as, as dads when we look at our daughters in this situation, right? So, so an episode like this is really helping. Um, I want to continue on, on the train of thought that Mike was talking about too, from, from, in, and I want to be specific around the group here, just questions parents should ask their daughters. Um, probably when you get into that pubescent time period, it's when most transitions into girls hockey takes place. But we talked about it earlier. I think a great question, please tell me if I'm wrong, is just, hey, what's, what's your goal? Is your goal to be a pro hockey player, collegiate hockey player? Do you want to be the next Megan Bozek, right? Or is your goal you just you just you're just having fun, right? Um, and, and again, I'm with you, Megan. We all are here. Play other sports. My daughter plays softball. She loves that too. I, I while I'm a hockey person, I try not to make sure she thinks she's a hockey person, right? I, I I always have to remind myself that, like, no, she's a little athlete. That's what she is. But getting back to it, the questions. What is your goal? What are the other questions? parents should have in the back of their minds when they're in the time period these discussions take place? I think too, if like I, I have a little guy at home too, and if he came to me and said, I want to be an NHL player. Okay, great. That's not going to matter to me until years and years ahead right. where right. we could actually maybe put him in a different position if he chooses that path. Um, I think it's getting so specialized at such a young age that it's hard because you'll ask someone, what's your goal? Okay. I want to be, I want to be in the PWHL. Yeah. Great. 
So what is going to change at the age of eight to make sure you become a PWHL player? It should be nothing. Right. It should be, you are a child that has so much learning to do that you have these goals and you have these dreams. And that is absolutely amazing to talk about. Um, but that should be irrelevant to what you're going to put them in for the next few years. And that's my, that's my thought on it. That's my take on it. I have just seen so many females, so many males that have specialized too young Mm -hmm. that maybe their career as a youth ends because they don't like it anymore. Um, whatever it may be. Yeah. It's it's a burnout. Um, I think more of the conversation between a parent and like a daughter should be, do you feel comfortable there? Are you having fun with your friends? Are you learning something? Um, and that's all, that's all it is. But I think as a parent, it, like, I know my parents would ask me when I was playing with the boys, the same exact questions. Do you have friends out there? Like, are you being nice to other people? Are you being a good teammate? Right. Um, because it, it all revolves around that. So I don't think the conversation necessarily has to change with if there's a girl playing with the boys, if a boy's playing with the girls, if it's all girls, if it's all boys, um, it should be the same. You need to raise a good human. You yeah. need to raise a good kid, a kind kid, because let me tell you, when you get older, word travels fast. So if you have a dream to play college hockey, college coach will give me a call and be like, oh, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, she's very disrespectful. Okay, off the list. Done. Yeah. It, as quick that's as it is. word it's of mouth. That's, exactly. <laughs> that's all. That's all it is. You know, it, it's interesting you bring this up too because you're right. The questions are very similar, no matter whether you're talking to a boy or a girl. And we always like to reiterate on the show that you don't want to overdo it with the questions. Like you don't want to ask the same question every day. Are you okay? Are you okay? Okay. But <laughs> I think it's also important to note that don't assume your child is going to just tell you, Hey, I'm uncomfortable. And I'll tell you why parents. And and again, again, we can have a discussion on this too. Um, At one point, not too long ago, the uh, women's ice hockey and college rate was like 50% of girl hockey players got to play in college, which is, it was by far the biggest conversion rate in all of the NCAA that's division one and and three. Um, What that did, I think to a lot of fathers and parents was, Oh, you've got a chance. You've got a great chance. And you start telling your kid that at 10 years old, right? Now you have made this somewhat of a job or your dreams are ending up going down to them, right? And this is not their goal per se yet. And and really at eight, nine, 10, Megan, to your point, that's really not what they should be thinking about. It's great to dream. Don't get me wrong, right? But there's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of things that are going to be happening, right? So the FOMO aspect of, well, 50% of girls make college hockey teams can really put pressure on your kid if they are uncomfortable not to tell you that because they don't want to disappoint you or other common things that Mike and I have heard on this show is, do you know how much money I've invested in you to play this game? What do you think a kid understands about that? They don't have a, they don't understand that fully. They understand there's, they pay you pay for things, but when you tell a kid, well, the money is the value and not your, your mental state, that's what ends up happening. So, just to kind of get off my soapbox here, you should ask. Every, you should just tap in every once in a while. Are you you comfortable? You having a good time? You having a great time? Be honest with me, right? It's okay if you're not. Boys and girls, I think, should be asked that question once a season, right? Are you having fun out there? If and and if they give you an answer that's like I'm not really, just have the discussion. That that's that's what our jobs are as parents. <laughs> at the end of the day, but you got to be careful the pressure you put on your kids. And I said you know, for young girls. I remember when I heard that stat, and in one of the rinks I play at, Megan, they have banners of girls. I mean, across an entire rink, there's lots of names, all who have made college hockey programs. And I love, I love that the rink is very proud. But it's also, like for me, you know, like I said, Dad, you're like, wow, that's an opportunity. But I can't put that on my kids, right, of of that's what you need to do now, right? So. I'm trying to make the, that point of just we got to mind our own selves here in these situations because it can be exciting, <laughs> especially if your kids showing promise. But you got to be present. You got to be where your body is. It's a day to day journey and things can change. 
getting back to what Megan said too is is the high when you start getting up into the high level so girls parents listening to this when you're 16 17 18 you're being recruited like what Megan said word of mouth travels fast mm -hmm. when you're playing high levels college coaches are looking for character they're going to sit down they're going to talk to your family if you are a high level recruit that coach may come to your house for dinner so character is what they're looking for on the high levels right so um if you have sort of nut job parents that are screaming it's too much and it's trickled into the kids body language where it's you know you have to you really have to emphasize being a good person and i think you know whether you make it or not in hockey that's going to transition into the rest of your life and your work life that you're a good person so i think some of that we get away from when we're just looking specifically at a kid being a good hockey player right. to make it to ncaa to college to pro you need to be a good person well great people make great players right we we preach that on this show that that and you and you said it sherry character is part of the prerequisites if you want to do it and, and again if you have immense talent immense talent you you may make it someplace but it, it in in our experiences and the people we've interviewed it's not going to last as long as you want it to if you don't have that character piece right sorry megan did you have a comment on that no i i just laughed when sherry said they may do home visits um <laughs> yeah I, I got a story I coming a, on here yeah, yeah yeah I had a home visit and I wanted to play at University of Wisconsin through and through I wanted to be a badger it was two hours from home a big homebody and I had the Minnesota coach Brad Frost come in and do a home visit he was in town whatnot and comes in and I forgot that I had a Wisconsin poster oh, hung no. up <laughs> yeah so he walks in he's like okay um this is great wow like cool poster kind of thing I'm like oh gosh like yeah I ended up going to Minnesota so it was all fine but it's a running joke now that <laughs> yeah, yeah like maybe should have yeah maybe should have uh taken that down but character builds everything character will make or break a team will make or break your culture and there's not going to be even playing time there's not going to be even uh, dressing time, um, but character develops those leaders on the ice, off the ice, uh, whether you play 23 minutes, whether you play 13 seconds, if people can come to you, you're a leader, uh, regardless if you have a letter on your jersey or not. So that's just as important as being a top line scorer because every team needs those character building players to complete their team. There's a reason you play a team sport and not an individual sport. Yeah. I, I think in, in seeing you two in action and, and watching, uh, you know, and we're talking about how the growth of girls and women's hockey is so big it, but at the, at the, in the real scheme of things, it's tiny, right? I mean, it's, it's a, you're, you know, and you've mentioned it a couple of times in your talks with these, you know, elite 11 and 12 year olds, that because it's so small and because it's so compressed, you are going to run into the same girls every single tournament, every single tryout, every single showcase. And then you then that reputation follows you. And it's so hard to change that initial piece. Like once you get that little, you know, and I think, you know, and really mom and dads too, right? Talk about you. Know, you're, you're a recruiter. You're in the stands. You're in the registration process. You're, you're in the thick of the tryouts. Talk real quick just about that mom and dad and what their intensity is like with the girl, you know, signing up and registering and how that affects your decisions to put certain people on certain teams. If you're a parent, keep your mouth shut as best as you can, but for the right reasons. So if you see something, you say something, whatnot, but you have to realize that you are putting your trust to drop your kid at the bus stop and send them to school five days a week. You can do the same thing, but now you have a little more leniency when you get into sports because you drop them off. Well, now I can watch. Oh, well, now I can talk to the coaches. Mm. Oh, now I see a recruiter. I see a college coach. Let me just go ease my way up there. It, it's a balancing act, but let your son, let your daughter perform. And if they need help, that's when you step in but let them do that. You're not going to go to college with them. You are not going to go to the rink every day with them. And I will tell you, and I've seen it before, if you have parents that get too involved with 
a coaching staff with um, now talking to college coaches, it travels. People know. And it's not a good look to have. Let your daughters just play without the stress of worrying about, oh, I see dad in the stands. He's talking to someone. Or I see dad or mom mm-hmm. in the stands. And move your feet, move your feet. Coaching from Coaching from the stands. Let them play. There's time after, and I, I know Mike, we chatted about this last month on a panel. Give it a little bit in the car. Let the game sink in, whatever it may be. You can talk for a few minutes, but if you just give so much information for, say, an hour car ride, I'll tell you right now, your son or daughter is going to listen for probably the first five minutes and then be like, okay, this is so negative or too much information. Yeah, headphones on. Selective hearing is at its finest, at its peak right there. But you have to give them time to realize. Give yourself a five to ten minutes chat with your child, and then that's it. They're not going to learn much from you jumping down at them to say, well, you could have done this, you could have done this in the second period. Why didn't you make that pass to to Claire out there? Well, I don't even remember that play because I had 16 other ships before and after that. So there's got to be a balance. I think the parents have to understand and realize and um, there's a lot that comes to it and emotions play a part in your child's performance as well. Big time, big time. And yeah. it, they might yeah. not talk back to you, but they're, they're now processing it. And then when, for all of us, when enough is enough, what happens? Yeah. some something explodes so parents I think let your child do their work at the rink um, if you want to have a conversation absolutely to get to know the coach whatever it may be but don't interfere with other things just trust that there are others trying to help your son or daughter one of our most popular episodes ever on the show is titled the car ride is not for coaching <laughs> um and again i always joke with the the eight-year-olds and i said you know i told parents you know what your kids think about after the game well, how they played fortnite <laughs> they're thinking about getting back on the xbox and the nintendo switch and probably not thinking too much about hockey now with that said uh every parent loves it but when a kid says hey how'd i do today what'd you think about the game today if, it, if they engage i engage but after the game is and it's hard i was saying this to parents it's hard but i won't you don't bring it up unless unless they do right the car ride home is is not for coaching. Um, one last question from me here, Megan. I'm going to throw it back to Sherry. Um, it's an important question to ask for the for the purpose of this episode. You know, um, what should we educate boys and men about when having a girl on the team? We talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of just uh, no special treatment or not not providing special treatment that's, that way. But I think it's also important. You know, and you can speak directly to me if you want as a, as a dad and as a coach. To even my boy players, what should we be educating them about when it comes to this? And it might it might be like you said, just don't treat ladies any differently, right? But what what is what is the, the answer to that question? <laughs> yeah, I think um, obviously depending on age and all of that, and obviously if there's a girl in the locker room, don't get unchanged and all of that. But as a younger youth, um, treat them as your friend. Treat them as your friend. Be kind. That's your teammate. If you have the same jersey on out there, that's your teammate. That's your friend. You don't have to be friends off the ice if you don't want to be, but just be kind. Everyone is learning. Everyone is trying to gather new friends and and gain new friendships. Um, Just don't be a bad person. That that's honestly my advice to what it, to what it comes down to. And I think as they get older, conversations will, will be different and, Oh, why do we have a girl on the team? Why do we, Yeah, I hear like, that. what is she doing? What is she doing here? Let's pick on her today. Like I've seen it. I've been through it. I've heard it all. Um, and it, it's just the nature of society, unfortunately, but just be a kind person. You're all there for the same reason for that 60 minutes, 50 minutes, depending on where you live, like be a good person. And I'll go back to this through and through. There is a reason that you play a team sport and you're not playing an individual sport. You look to others to help you, to help yourselves, but you're working for that front of that jersey. If you wanted to do anything else, 
then you wouldn't then you wouldn't be here so just be a kind just be a kind person i think it does have to take a little bit of work from the parents to have conversations with their children to say okay you do have a, a girl on your team that that's great this is her name and um that is is what it is if there's obviously if issues arise have have a conversation first and foremost um but for the younger i i don't see any difference of having to say okay there's a girl on the team or you have a new teammate right but a teammate everyone yeah, yeah like yeah. it shouldn't matter if you have a new girl on your team oh you have a new boy on your team oh you have a new teammate you have right. new teammates every year like you guys have new co-workers I, I can't speak it but like you have new co-workers every year you have new employees every year like yeah it's it's not like oh you have a new lady at the desk over there no, you have a new employee, you have a new coworker. So I think as as the kids get older, there has to be different conversations. Um, but as the younger youth, like you have a new teammate. That's all. So Megan, I'm sitting here in Vegas, uh, recording this from City National Arena. And right now in the background, there's a boys hockey tournament going on. It's eight in the morning right now. There is a all girls team registered playing in this boys tournament. Yesterday, that all girls team, it is an East Coast girls team. Um, they beat a boys team eight nothing. So what I want to get into is kind of the stigmas around girls playing hockey and girls hockey. And uh, yeah, if you can just speak on stigmas that are not true about girls hockey development. If they can play, they can they can play out there why do they only have to compete against girls i love oh well there's a girls team in the tournament okay oh, well the, parent, the parents them. are upset the boys are upset slamming sticks I love like it. they're getting I love stripped, it. stripped and lit up and the boys are slamming their sticks and it's kind of interesting it's like these boys are you know 12 years old like why why are they so upset you know it's like where is this coming from that this is this stigma is still around that boys are better or they're or they're better than girls and it's like at this age they're all the same and if anything i would argue that girls mentally at 11 and 12 years old are ahead of boys so it's not that surprising that they are lighting them up but yet the parents are mad the boys are mad like where is this coming from yeah like who still are they in, learning still in who are they learning that from yeah yeah where are these boys learning that from is my I'll question answer. and answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like growing up, I had the opportunity to play in the Pee Wee Quebec tournament and I played on the first girls team with Mano Rayom as our, oh, as nice. my coach and we That's would awesome. beat the boys and boys like it's crazy. Do they get that emotional after every other game? Do they, it's wild. And Sherry, like you said, it's 2024. I can't believe this is still a thing, but where are they learning that from? Where are they? Oh, well, we had to change our game because we couldn't hit them. No. Well, if you don't have checking, <laughs> this is 12. Then you, yeah, this exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there's no checking. Your game has not changed. You're just, I don't know if you're embarrassed. I don't know if your parents are embarrassed that you just lost to a girl's team, but you just lost to another team. Yeah, I was just going to say, you girls, lost to a hockey team. Yeah. yeah, like the girls, some may say like, okay, we have a lot more to prove out here and other teams just go and play. And that's when they do prove that they can compete, if not be better than whatever other team they're playing. And if it happens to be a bunch of boys, it happens to be a bunch of boys. Um, for myself, I, I know being the only girl on the boys team growing up, I felt like I always had something to prove to make sure I belonged on that team because it was a very competitive AAA team and, in all of that, but looking back, I feel like it made me better. And through through all of it, um, I, I just think it's I think it's self explanatory of like where do they learn that from? Why are they slamming their sticks? Why are they? Where did you hear that being beat by a girl is still a bad thing? It's well, I think more of it. I think that I think that, and I think that, you know to Sherry's point though the stigma part comes from education, right? It comes from the fact that when you're in the world of sport, you know that 11, 12, and 13-year-old girls on the most part are stronger and bigger and, and, and you know, maturity-wise, sure. they're in a different place. Like, they're able to understand concepts more. It's not just physical play. 
although they can be physical. It's just, I think that's piece is that educational piece sometimes of, you know, and I'd love to hear, you know, are the girls' parents in the stands like whooping it up too? Like, look at we just did, you know, you know, wait, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big what goes around comes around type of guy. So, you know, I always kind of be careful about, you know, where you are in your, in that, in that snapshot of time. Um, and we're, you know, as a player. And I think, you know, if you're educated in the sport or sports and athleticism, you'll know that, like, if I'm a boys coach of an 11 and 12 year old boys, you're know, like, oh crap, you know, these girls are going to kick our ass. Like, this is like, they're just because now they got an all star team of girls at, at, you know, at, at, you know, where they're peaking quicker than my very immature, small, and and uh you know feeble young men here so so i think it's just i think it's just a matter of just knowing you know the context of where you're at but i think that piece of the stigma comes from like any you know anything else it comes from the education and understanding and maybe those coaches of the boys teams need to come in and like, like me i'd be preemptively being like hey listen we're playing you know girls that are going to be more mature and they're stronger and they're an all-star team and I, yeah, I what, kind what of- an opportunity I would help my boys understand that this is not a negative. It's that they're playing, they're actually playing a higher level athletic team and let's try to compete with them. And I think that's just how you can help, you know, frame that. So it's not a stick swinging, you you know, angry (laughs) boys that are all worked up that they're getting. Well, you know, I'll I'll add in too here, Mike, that my son's team and his division, there was an all girls team uh, with the junior flyers. And I think the coaching staff uh, for my son's team, and he, he's a, a squirt, so a little younger than 12, but the way they presented that team was you're playing the junior flyers tonight and the junior flyers are a really good program. And, and yeah. which is a hundred percent true nice. for that team. Yeah. It was never, you're playing a girl's team. And, right. and when they, it, you know, that team kicked their, their butts a few times, <clears throat> there was obviously some chatter of like, they're all girls, but they, it, it, so what? Like that was kind of the, it's a hockey team you're playing. You're playing the junior flyers. I don't, you know what that symbol means on their jersey, right? There's probably people listening like, wow, it means this. No, the point was you're playing another hockey team. I don't, didn't matter uh, uh, from a coaching standpoint, if you will, um, the gender of the other team. Um, I think another important thing, and Megan, you brought it up, but I'll, I'll say it as, as a guy. Um, I hear things all the time. And I think as, as, as men and women, but mostly men, you got to mind the things you're saying. I'll give you a great kind of low level example that I hear every year. I live in Philadelphia. We love the Philadelphia Eagles here. The amount of dads who have daughters that call the Dallas Cowboys the Dallas Cowgirls is astounding to me. Now, I understand what you're trying to do, but what you're doing is putting the word girl as a weakness is that's what makes them weak now that you're calling them the Cowgirls. I remember I turned to one of my friends and said, like, what, what are you doing? Like your daughter's right there. Like, don't you realize what that means to her? You're telling her they're weaker as the cowgirls. And again, you can, this is one of those things at home. You can roll your eyes and say, wow, that's different. Yeah. You got to mind your language. And there's a lot of language that um, it's all, I will say this. It is always getting better, but, but there's a lot of language that we'll just say, and you don't, realize that like like without going into it dads when someone's weak in your mind what is the go-to word (laughs) that most men say you're a blank and it's not right to say that now to be fair i've heard girls say that too all right but my point is it's like you got to think about these things before you say them it's in your language right now you tell you tell a boy till they're 12 don't be a blank don't do this don't be a girl you're playing like a girl Megan, to your point, Sherry, to your point, what do you think happens when a girl beats them? You've been telling them that that's weakness, which it's not, for their whole life. So you, that, to me, that's part of the solution here and breaking that stigma is mind your language when you're talking to your own kids. And, and again, dads and some moms, to your, you, you probably don't even realize you're doing it. You're just not conscious to it. I'm not, I'm not trying to point a finger at you. You don't have to feel massive shame. If this is something you've done, if you've recognized what we're talking about here, just make the change. It I mean, John that. Cooper, John Cooper just did it. Yeah. I mean, he had to apologize <laughs> yeah. for the, the thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a, I had to ask a, a coach that we had, you know, and he's an older guy and coaching our, with our lacrosse kids. He's like, come on, ladies, you got to get going out here. I'm like, listen, John, you really can't sit Don't anymore. Say that. You know, yeah. I said, ladies really will kick your ass. You put me, in a, you put me <laughs> in a bad spot here. You know what I mean? So I said, but, but at the same time, uh, you know, to Megan said earlier, don't be uh, don't be not hard. 
on the girls. Like you've got to, if you're listen, if you're, it's going to go both ways, right? You're going to be like, listen, I'm, I'm going at you right here. And I think from a, from a, like a grow the game perspective and, and from where my, I stand most of the time in my professional career, I, I kind of put the girls into groups earlier it younger, not thinking about the development piece, but thinking about the social piece right. and thinking about like, everybody's not built. I mean, Megan Bozak and, and, and Sherry Huspeth and, you know, you guys are, I'm, I, I can guarantee you, you were elite athletes growing up. I, I you were probably the best athlete boy, is a key word there too. Boy yeah. or girl, it didn't matter. Yeah, but the fact is there's a lot of boys and a lot of girls that aren't that. And uh, for us to grow the sport, sometimes we have to put the, you know, the, 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 you know, the girls that aren't as aggressive, the girls that maybe are a little bit, you know, and boys, you know, in, in, in places where they can succeed and try to keep them in the sport as long as we can and then see if they blossom out. But not every, not everybody's going to be like, Oh yeah, I can't wait to play with the boys. I'm going to kick their butt. And, and that, and it's, and goes, that's just not how all our athletes are made. Um, and Sherry experiences this now because she's part of growing the game. You know, it's not her the job, right? And Megan, you job with the, you know, with the stuff with the Rangers you do and other programs is not to produce PWHL players. It's to grow the game. And I think right. that's where, you know, we, we, you could be a little bit of everything, but understand and watch that athlete and say, okay, where can I push this athlete? Boy, girl, whatever. And if you could push them, there's a lot of boys that I, I'd be like, listen, I'd stay out of checking until I was 16 if I was you, because you're you're gonna you're gonna quit the sport because you can't handle it. But all of a sudden at 16, you're like, oh my God, where'd that kid come from? He just grew seven inches and <laughs> got mean and you know, and then and, and got confidence and and now, but they stay lasted in the sport long enough to succeed. And I think that's really one of the biggest pieces here, uh, you know, of that of that total development. So Megan, we're out of time, but I have to ask you this one kind of quirky question. If I'm not mistaken, you won two national championships with the Golden Gophers. Is that correct? Yep, oh, Golden tough. Gophers. All right. <laughs> so, so did did Wisconsin ever contact you in any way and just think about that <laughs> from this other standpoint? Oh, we don't have yeah. to talk. <laughs> you know what? I again was put in a very good position. Um, to have a choice of of what school I wanted to to play at and I love that Wisconsin was close I was also looking at Boston College Boston University and Harvard just too far for me um I don't think my studies were up to grade to go to Harvard so uh, I visited Minnesota I absolutely loved it when I got on campus knew I wanted to spend four years there and Wisconsin ended up winning my sophomore year and then we beat Wisconsin my junior year to yeah. win the yeah. national championship. And then we actually went undefeated my senior season Yeah, and won another championship. So no That's hard feelings. I think one of the best things parents take note of this um, that I ever did was before I committed to Minnesota, I called Wisconsin, Harvard, BC, and BU mm. and told them I was committing somewhere else. So they heard it from me. It wasn't an email. I called them on the train down, going downtown Chicago with my mom. I'm in tears, but I knew it had to be done. And to this day, coaches still remember that. And it's kind yeah. of something so simple that took 10 minutes out of my day that it was, they're hearing this decision from me um, in all of that. So it, when you have communication, choose to communicate, but don't do it for your children. That's that character piece that we've been talking about. Uh, Megan, a few things I want to thank you for. One, I want to thank you for everything you've done for hockey uh, at every level you've played at. Your, your character is oozing out of this podcast in the best way possible, but it, it is such an honor to have you on. And that's the second thing I want to thank you for is giving us so much time today to discuss this issue. Um, and I know our audience really appreciates it. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think you guys are are in good hands and coming up around the youth with with Sherry and Mike, it's it's a great podcast to be on when you have so many people involved in the youth. And um, yeah, it's just incredible to see where hockey has grown. And I don't think you ever could have imagined that Sherry would be running a program in Las Vegas. 
when it's 176 degrees out. So um, yeah. that's what the kind of people you need to, to make the world go around. So thank you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah thanks and Megan for joining too. This is such an important conversation. Obviously growing the girls game, get asked a lot. We wanna to try to get as many girls playing hockey as possible. And we do have girls programming here. So educating parents that it is, you know, it is great. You can make the Olympics playing girls hockey. You can go college hockey, or you can just have friends, like whatever path works for you. So very important conversation today. And I really appreciate your time, Megan. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to seeing where we're at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now as the game continues to grow. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of Our Girls Play Hockey. For Mike Benelli, Sherry Hudspeth, and Megan Bozek, I'm Lee Elias. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Have a great time and skate on. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.